Shall we? Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask your blessing right now. Amen. Amen. I'm going to need your help with the bulletin. So for whatever reason, if somebody can help, the sermon is not on the screen yet. Uh, as, as they're trying to get this done, there you go, there it is, all right. Uh, look into your study guides, all right, make sure you have your study guides right now because you're, you're going to have to do some work with your study guides. Uh, I have not filled in all the things, I left some things in blank, so you can participate as we go on this. The other thing also that I would like to let, let you know, a lot of people have mentioned this and actually not a whole lot of people are aware of this. If you do not know, we have an actual YouTube channel. If people sometimes have watched sermons and like to share this with somebody or something or the baptisms and many other church events, if you go to YouTube and you put on the search bar, Baltimore White Marsh SDA Church, it will pop up. And you have to click on subscribe and you will become one of, one of our subscribers to our channel. And you will be able to go back there. You have a, a sermons from two years in the past. You can watch them again, rewatch. You can send to somebody, share it wherever you are. Because if God has blessed you through ministries in this church, either a sermons that I preached or anybody else has preached, that is a tool that you can use to bless someone else. Amen? So not every single message is there. Sometimes we've, we've had issues, whatever. But a big chunk of them are there. Uh, the last, at least the message last week is already there. And others. And this one hopefully will be there as well. So just for your, uh, e your information, you can use that too uh, to be a blessing and to share with others. Okay? Just wanted to share this with you right now. So anyways. Today's our third and last sermon on the series, Toxic Faith. And the title of the message, anyways, the, the series is called, the, the sermon series is called Toxic Faith. And the message today is called Detox, Healing for the Wounded Soul. And nowadays, now it's very common to hear the word detox, isn't it? Detox, it's usually associated with a diet. Uh, uh, detox drinks, detox food, detox whatever. And it's usually this, this diet, this process in which you're, you're going through this diet to, to, to help your body to release the toxins, release the bad things, the things that were uh, impure in your body. And here's the analogy to the, to the series. If you have been involved with toxic faith, you've been a victim of toxic faith, you need an emotional detox. Toxic people, toxic relationship, they will poison you. And, and whether it's in the church, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, in your home, if you have been exposed to toxic faith, it would be almost like poison with this. And wherever you go, you will also poison others. You will release a little bit of toxin to everybody else you ever meet. It is like you being, uh, you, you contracted an airborne disease and, and it, everywhere you go you spread these germs, you spread toxins. And, and, and if, if you have become exposed to toxic faith, you need to understand how to go through this process. And we're going to study this right now together. And I'm going to show you now at least two things that are foundational for what we are about to see today. As I mentioned, if you've been exposed to toxic faith, you become a carrier. You become a host. And now, because this happened to you, you're going to, you're going to hurt other people. So, one of the first truths I want to share with you here today is this. Can you say this with me? Hurt people. Hurt people. Now, let's do it again. Hurt people hurt people. What does that mean? It means that if you have been hurt in the past, you, ha you, will, you will have a tendency to hurt in the present and hurt in the future. Have you met people that they're always angry, always aggravated, always mad at everybody else? And you come to find out they have been hurt in the past, now they're hurting everybody else. So the truth is that hurt people hurt people. The second thing I'd like you to be aware of is that if you want to be healed, if you want to find closure, if you want to find healing for your for or experiences of the past, this would not happen overnight or not over time. Say with me, not over night, not over 
time. Emotional wounds, they just don't heal overnight. And emotional wounds just don't heal over time. You have to be actually intentional about healing them. This is if you really want to find closure. Otherwise, you will spend your whole life with that little wound hurting and hurting and never understanding why you hurt so much. So what we're going to do here today is this. We're going to study five approaches towards toxic faith. These five approaches are actually very common. Four of them are famous. You and I are masters at four of them. Some choose one more than the others, but you and I are very, very good at four of them. The fifth one is the biblical method, Charles, and not a lot of us actually use it. But I can guarantee you that you and I are very good at four of them. Again, these are approaches to toxic faith and toxic relationships we experience, whether it is in the home, in the house, in the church, at work, and everybody else. So the first approach is we can deny. Can you say with me? Deny. The second one we can ignore. The third one we can stall. The fourth one we can retaliate. And the fifth one is we can actually address it the way the Bible asks us to do so. So these are the first four. You and I are masters of them. You just don't see them through this light. You've never thought of them this way, possibly. But we are really, really good at them. But the fifth one, only if you and I were to follow the fifth method, the biblical method, the method that Jesus taught us, much pain and many concerns and pains and, and grudges will be avoided. So let's go to the first one just briefly. The first one that you can deny a problem. Now, you know, when you deny a problem, you simply pretend the problem is not there. Have you met people in denial before? Yeah. Right? Absolutely you have. So you can deny consciously or you can deny unconsciously. If you deny consciously, you think like this. You know what? I see this problem, I see this behavior, I see this toxic behavior, but I'm going to deny it and hopefully one day it will just go away. I'm just going to deny it. It's not there. So I either get used to it or, you know, I just disappear. That's conscious denial. Now you can do denial unconsciously. And this happens like this. The pain of admitting that problem. The pain of admitting that you were toxic. The pain of admitting that you have been actually abused. The pain is so huge. It's so heavy that you deny the problem and hope this will go away. My question to you here is this. Can you actually solve a problem by denying it? Can you? Of course not. So denial, it's actually never, never good. But pastor, I can see somebody saying, you have no idea what you're talking about. I don't deny. I'm no, I'm down to earth person. I don't do anything like to deny my, my faults or my wrongs. And I say, really? You and I, we deny more than we want and more than we should. Let me give you just a few examples. Like the marriage has not been good for quite a while. The wife and the husband, you know, they've been with friction for quite a while. And, 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 and instead of actually admitting that your marriage needs help, and when people are like, How, how's marriage? How's everything? Everything is fine. Everything is great. And, and you deny that you're having a problem because you think what others will think, what others will say. So you deny completely you're having a marriage or problem. And just because you don't, you just don't want to deal with it. That's denial. The other one that I've seen quite a lot, churches are dwindling. Churches are dying. You know, when you come to the person, to the churches, they say, how's church doing? Great. Church is doing great. We have a new youth leader. Praise the Lord. He's a, fra he's a, he's a breath of fresh air. He's very experienced, our new youth leader. He's 67 years old. <laughs> and the church is doing great. A youth now, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing anybody who is old. What I'm telling you, what I'm, what I'm referring to you is, is the problem that we deny. Churches are dying. What, what, what about the gentleman whose car note is $500 a month for, 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 for a piece of junk? He drives around. He looks good on this. And when Christmas comes around, he goes and, and you know, and cranks up the, the credit card. You know, he buys so much stuff. It takes him 10 months to pay off the credit card. And if you were to ask him, you know, how, how are your finances or how are you doing? I'm doing great. I don't have a, I don't have a money problem. I'm very frugal. I only, I only buy things on sale. 
You have a money problem and you are in denial. But, or, or, or let me just bring now to what we discussed the last two sermons. What if you have that person in church who is always criticizing others? You give them the mic, they have a chance to say that somebody is asleep, that the church is not doing, and there are people in the leadership. They are always criticizing people. They are always pointing finger at the family, at the church, at job, at work. They are always finding fault with everybody else. And when somebody decides to confront them, Gilly, they play the victim card. Oh, no, 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 no. Look at this. This church is so unfair to me. You see, I'm a victim now. Oh, I'm like Jesus. I'm being persecuted in the name of the gospel. Listen, you have seen them criticizing people. You have seen them going in the back. You have seen them creating different meetings, separating people. You have seen them being divisive. You have seen them playing the victim card. But you still do not admit that they are toxic because they post Bible verses or EGY verses on social media. This is toxic. This is calling sin by its right name. And, and the more we come to terms with it, the better. We have to stop being in denial. But somebody may say, but pastor, what about thou shalt not judge? You guys are too quiet today. I, I need, I need to, to warm you up. Can you say with me, what about thou shalt not judge? That's better. Thank you very much. Because you will see the, the spirit is going to come down here. What about thou shalt not judge? So here is something I want you to understand this. The Bible warns us to not judge intentions, but the Bible warns us to actually judge actions. So I want you to say this with me here. We don't judge the root, but we judge the fruit. Say with me again. We don't judge the root, but we judge the fruit. I'm about to show. Everybody knows thou shall not judge. You know this verse. But the Bible also tells us in Matthew 7... Beware of false prophets. Let me just replace here. Beware with toxic people. They are there to offend you. They are there to hurt you. They are there to put you down. Who comes in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Everybody, you will know them by their fruits. By their fruits, not by their roots. Their roots is intention, but the actions you can know. It says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer, of course, is not. And, and he says this, even so every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down and thrown into the fire. Now everybody, by their fruits, you will know them. So I, re I repeat, we do not judge the root, but we judge the fruit. So you cannot judge the intentions. But if you see that person time and time and time and time again, criticizing others, playing the victim card, always there uh, undermining leadership, always putting any leader. It's not, it's not because of you are a leader. It's just because they're, they're not the leader that they wanted to be. You are taking their place. They will always try some way, shape or form, steal the power and authority and put upon them the victim card or the martyr syndrome. We cannot judge the root but we can certainly judge the fruit. Is that helpful? I want you to remember that. I want you to seriously remember that. Oh, we cannot judge. We can't judge intentions. But the actions, absolutely we can judge the actions. But here's my point with denial again. We deny more than we want and far more than we should. And here's, denial is never helpful. It's never helpful. If you deny a problem, you will never solve it. Ever. Ever. So this first approach that many of us take in church, in life, in marriage, at work, it never actually works. If you are in denial, stop being in denial. The second approach that we discussed about is that we can also do what? Ignore. Now, ignoring is different than denial. When you deny it, just denial. When you ignore it, you know, you know it's there. You acknowledge it's a problem, but you simply ignore. 
And by ignoring it, you'll think, you know, sometime it, it, will, be, it, it will be gone. My question, is it always wrong to ignore? No. Are you hearing me out? Is it always wrong to ignore something? No. So when should I ignore a problem? How do we know this? Well, it's very simple. When something is so small, when something is so insignificant, it, it's not worth your time. So you do what? You just ignore it. Are you listening? So, no, they dumped your furniture. You donated to church 25 years ago. They dumped your old furniture. Just ignore it. You're mad at this? Ignore it. Somebody picked a song that you don't like in music. What do you do? What do you do? Just ignore it. You know, just go along. You know, they, they, there's, there are things, just small stuff. Just small. If you let the small stuff get under your skin, wait until the big stuff comes. It will destroy you. It will, will break you apart. Are you listening? Somebody says something in church you don't like, that they told you something you don't like. You know what you do? Depending on what they say, you know what you do? Ignore it. Ignore it. No, just don't, 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 don't lose your sleep over the small stuff. Now, th this is some cases. But now the question is, when should I not ignore in church, at work, at home? And here is the, the important part. You should not ignore something when you see a pattern of behavior. Did you hear me? What did I say? A pattern of behavior. If that person is constantly saying negative things to you, about you or about someone else, this person is constantly playing the victim card. This person is constantly, consistently on a toxic behavior. Now you know you can no longer do what? Ignore it. Alright? So we, we're good with this. So again, we do not judge the Root, but we judge the fruit. And by the way, you can put this here on your, on your study guides. Because that's one of the blanks you have there. Moving right along now, we're on the third one. You can also do what? Stall. And this is probably the most common one. Stalling a problem, a situation is different than ignoring it. And stalling is this. You know there is a problem. You know you got to fix it. You know you got to talk to that person. But you know what? You just... Just don't do it. And you procrastinate. You take longer to actually address it. And you just don't do it. And people stall things for many reasons. Number one, they're too busy. Isn't that true? Life is busy. Some, some people just stall things because they just don't have the energy. Pastor, you don't, know, you don't get it. I just don't have the energy right now. I'm exhausted. Or, or people who stall because they're afraid of the outcome, of the results of that conversation. And many other reasons. A stalling a situation that needs to be addressed, it's never good. You hear me? It's never good. The longer it takes for you to actually address the situation, it will fester. It will grow. It can, it can, it can cause more damage. And watch this. Toxic people will stall things on purpose. But they do for different reasons. They know, they know if they stall something, they are buying time. Stalling a situation, not being able to come or whatever, just pretending or just coming up with a lot of excuses. They are buying time. They can spread more lies. They can, they can, they can get more people on their side and they do this on purpose. They know exactly what they are doing. Toxic people do this. So my friends, if you need to address something, if you want to find closure, it is not a wise thing to stall it, right? So the fourth one now you can also do, everybody, retaliate. When we retaliate, we, we hit back. We counter punch, we counter attack, you know? And how does that look like in church? Well, they spread lies about you, you go and spread lies about them. They say something you don't like, you go and tell them something that they don't like. They talk about your kids, you go and talk about their their kids. They did not invite you to the party. Oh, your party comes around. You invite everybody else in the church and the house and the family. But you make sure they know they were not invited. We know how to hit back. We are really good at this. You know? And, and, you know, the, and, and the, we just go around and people say something. We just hit right back. And we, we do all of this. And under the auspices of, you know, well, I don't take any offense home, you know, I tell it like it is, you know, uh, don't mess with me. This is who I am, you take me like I am. A major problem with this is that Bible calls this foolishness. You're, you're not 
being brave or courageous when you're telling what you think. You're being fool. You're being stupid. That's what the Bible says. Now, there is something else also with this. The Bible clearly, clearly tells us, Romans 12, 21. We'll go back to this text later, but it says this. Do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome with good. If someone is, listen to me, are you listening? If somebody spreads lies about you, you have the right and possibly the duty to defend yourself, but you don't have the right to spread lies about them. Do you hear me? If somebody is, 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 is smearing your character before the whole church, you have the right and possibly the duty to defend yourself, but you don't have the right to go and smear their character. You follow what I'm saying? Are you hearing me out? So, yes, you defend yourself, but you don't need to do the very same thing. Because if you were to do the very same thing you're accusing them of, you're just pro propagating it. It's just like, you know what, the way you beat the bully is by beating him down. Beat him up. And, and just give him like a, 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 like a black eye. You do not overcome bullying. You just became a bully yourself. Does that make sense? It says, okay, clear. Okay, so, so far we have seen four approaches. The first one is deny. The second one is ignore. The third one is stall. The fourth one is retaliate. These are four. You and I are very good at them. Uh, which one do you think you use the most? Don't tell me, just think. Which one do you think you do the most in general? At work, at church, at school? You deny more? You ignore more people? You stall things you should actually ta tackle them? Or you just retaliate? You hit back just like that? Because you take no offense home. Now we're about to look into the fifth one, which is the actually the biblical one. You can, you can actually do what? Address it. Now this is a very well-known biblical approach to this. Many of you have heard about this before, but some of us actually don't quite understand. Now I say this again. If you and I were to follow this process that Jesus teaches, a lot of issues, a lot of uh, 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 hurts and, 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 and problems in the church at home would be avoided. Because here it's a, natural, it's a very good point. There, there are two main goals with this. Hear me out. Number one is restoration. What did I say? restoration of a broken relationship and the second one is to keep as small as simple as possible as small and simple as possible those are the two goals of this system of this approach we're about to study this together I'm going to teach you this and I hope this will open your eyes to see how many things we could avoid a quick disclaimer this approach that Jesus taught us in the Bible it's not meant to be used in case of domestic abuse or, or, or financial abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. Did you hear me? It is not meant to be used. If your spouse is hitting you, if your spouse is threatening you, if your spouse is humiliating you, you do not address in this way. This way, it's different matters that need to be addressed. If you actually endanger, your spouse is threatening you, whatever, you can take a picture right now. You can take a picture just for anybody else that you may need. You call the National Domestic Violence Hotline and let us know as a church as well. Amen. Unfortunately, as a church, we have helped more people than we wanted because of domestic abuse. And we'll not stand behind any abuser at all. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, what I'm about to discuss now does not apply to this. Mo February next year, we'll have a specific sermon about this, domestic violence in the home. And we'll address that, how we actually go through this process. But just for today, if you're going through this issue, trust me. If you come to me as a pastor, pastor, I'm going through a problem. I'm not going to tell you to follow this pattern. Are we good? Are we good? All right, all right. So let's look at the biblical pattern. Go to Matthew 18 with me. I'm going to read here from my notes, but I want you to go to your Bibles, actually, as we're going to look this. Again, this is a very famous approach. A lot of people are familiar with it. But now we're going to exegete. We're going to, we're going to just dig in the Scripture and find out what he actually means. Are we good? If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, Matthew 18. I'm reading verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, you go tell him his fault between you and him alone. 
If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. But then verse 16 says this. But if he would not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like you, let, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Then verse 18 says, Assuredly, for sure I tell you, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, verse 20 is very famous. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there with them in the midst of, in the midst of them. Okay, so I want you to go to your study guide right now. Okay, go to your study guide right now. By the way, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is right here on this piece of, piece of paper as well. If you need that for somebody as well, it's right here for your help. So go to your study guide. Now, this process has at least four steps. The first step, as you saw, is that talk to the person privately. Did you see what the text says? It says, it says moreover, if your brother sins against you, you go tell him his fault between you and him. You hear him alone. If he hears you, you have gained a, you have gained a brother. Most problems will not get worse. Most problems will be solved right here at this level. If only we had a chance to go to the person and say, you know what, I heard something. Did you say something? You know, I don't know what you meant. Can you just be clear, you know, or, or I heard you said that, brother or sister. You know, can you just let me know if this really um, makes sense? Now, this is not the time to bring more people around. This is not a time to bring the pastor, the elders, the deacons. Now, you can go seek them for counsel. You can seek the pastor or the elders, the volunteer pastor, say, you know what, this is going on. Can you help me? What, what do I do? Yes, it's okay to seek counsel. But not just to bring more people into the problem. Are you listening? Are you listening? So this is the time for you to address face to face that person. Just go to them and speak to them. Toxic people would never do this. Toxic people are cowards. They are rarely there to tell you up your face. They usually go around behind the scenes, you know, backstabbing you when, you, when you're not watching. That's what toxic people do. You know what? Just an example. Now, one day, uh, 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 a member of the church came to me and said, Pastor, you know what? I heard this gentleman saying this and this and that, you know. I'm very frustrated. How dare this man, you know, who's supposed to be a man of God, say this, you know. I just can't stand it. And, and by, by, the, by what this member was telling me, I, I asked, you know what? Did you actually speak to the, this, this, this member? She says, no, no, I, but did you hear it? Yes, I, I heard it. I said, are you sure because you're describing to me, it doesn't sound like that person at all. No, this is what happened. No, he really said this, you know. And I said, okay, why don't you go actually and talk to this person? And this, this member went and actually spoke to that person. Just a few days later, the member came back to me. Pastor, you have no idea. He says, no, I don't. But tell me, I had a conversation. It was just one big misunderstanding. I, it, they were joking, whatever. I misunderstood, and we had a great time. Amen, right? It's just simple. I'm not telling stories where he was, whatever. But the point is this. If you approach the person first, before you hear something, now, now you start uh, working this in your heart and, and bottling this up. This would, not, would do you no good. So take the time to speak to the person. Privately, alone, directly, face to face. Don't let it harbor. Don't let it fester in your heart. Don't go around spreading lies to everybody else. But remember, toxic people will never do this. So on your study guide, step one, talk to the person privately. The second step of this is bring witnesses. If the person, you talk to them privately... You had the nice conversation and you turn around, they go back doing the very same thing. They continue to hurt you. They continue their toxic behavior. Now it is the time to bring more people. Do you tell the whole church yet? 
No. Bring just a few witnesses. The pastor, the elder, another member that you trust, somebody that you trust. And why do you have to do this here? Because you need to establish a, a, an agreement where you have witnesses. Do you hear me out? It's not just your word against theirs. Now you have witnesses. You have somebody. No, I was there in that meeting. I know exactly what has happened. Maybe the person did not take you seriously. Maybe the person is just being toxic. Their behavior has not changed. So you go. And the Bible says clearly. But it will, if you will not hear you take with you one or two more by their mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word may be established. Now I want you to, are you guys paying attention right now? Are you listening? I'm about to tell you something very important that is highly misunderstood. And this is just like a, 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 a nugget on this sermon. The next verse I'm about to read to you is highly misunderstood. It's usually used to say that the church, we have the authority to change the Bible. Or say, you know what, now we say Sunday is the new day of worship, so Sunday is the new day of worship. This text is used for a lot of Christians to say something else. Look what the text says. Surely I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning Anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So this text has been used for many, many centuries to say that the church has the authority now to tell you. No, the church has changed. You know what? We have bound this on earth and therefore it's bound in heaven. Now, what is this text actually talking about? Is this talking about doctrine? Is this talking about the Ten Commandments? Is he talking about like morality? No, it is talking about it specifically when two people had an issue and the issue has not been resolved. You bring witnesses now to discuss and whatever you decide on that meeting, whatever you agree on that meeting, whatever you bind, you bind on that meeting on earth will be bound in. Does that make sense now? That's what he's saying. So what I, what I want you to realize is this, that this is very important. Because when you come to a meeting with a person that you're having issues, and this toxic behavior keeps rap happening, and when you meet with the witnesses of two or more, three people, and both of you agree, okay, I will not do this again, he will not do this again, thank you very much, God bless you, let's move forward. If you break that promise, you're not only breaking a promise that was bound on earth, you're breaking a promise that was bound in heaven. That's what this text is saying. So don't ever think that somebody tell you, no, we have changed it because the Bible says we bound on earth, now it is bound in heaven. No, 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 no. Do you see what I, So you have to be careful. Now it's a text that is even more misunderstood. Matthew 18, 20, for wherever, where, where, where there are two or three are gathered in together in my name, I am there, what? In the midst of it. How many of you have heard this text before? I think a lot of us, right? And you know, this text is usually used when we have two or three people for prayer meeting. And now we get discouraged, you know, like oh, or, or two or three people showed up for, for volunteer day or whatever. You know, it's just, you know, whether there are two or three, my name I shall be among Jesus is right here with us, right? It is wrong. It is wrong. Jesus promised that will always be with us no matter what. So if you are alone by yourself, Jesus is there with you. It's right there in Matthew 28. What he's saying here is this. In this meeting with this person where you have two or three witnesses, who else is a witness among you? Jesus. So if you agree with somebody that you're, you're going to stop this behavior or whatever, Jesus is there with you. So you stop quoting this verse when two people show up for prayer meeting or whatever. This verse is a serious matter. When you have an initiative with somebody and both of you agree and there's two or three people there, Jesus is one of the witnesses. Does that make sense? Yeah. Make sense now? Okay. So you've got to be very careful because when you, when you leave that church, or you leave that meeting. Uh, when, you, when you see that behavior happening again, this person now is going against the witness of Jesus Christ himself. Do you, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Alright, cool. It's, 
If even at this time the person did not change their behavior, the behavior continues. They agreed upon earth, they agreed in the meeting, but they continue doing the very same thing. Now you bring in step three. You bring in the church. Put it down in the study guide right now here. You bring in the church. Now it is the time that you do this. How do you bring that church? Do you go on the mic and says, hey guys, by the way, you have no idea what I saw, you know, Jesse or, or, or Ike doing. Is that what you do? No. You speak to specific leaders. Pastor, our volunteer pastors, the elders, you know, and, and they, usually in the church of our size, we'll discuss it at the board of elders. We'll discuss about it. We will pray about it. Now more people are aware of this. Depending on the case, the elders may have to bring it to the church board. But before the elders bring to the church board, they will try to meet with this person again, with the two parties involved. And they will try to hash out the issues amongst them before you bring before the church board. Are you listening? Why do we do this? There are two principles. One is restore, restore. Ration. The second one is keep as simple and small as possible. You don't want to spread. You don't want to be just going around because you want to respect people as well. When the church gets involved, the elders, and, and hopefully never a church board at this level, hopefully by then the person will finally realize, wow, you know, this thing is just escalating. It's getting big. You know, I better just, you know, maybe, maybe I'm really toxic. Maybe, you know, I got to change my behavior. And hopefully by then, they, they accept the truth and they change. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. But if it doesn't change, unfortunately now, we have to, to go to the fourth step. The church must take action. I want you to hear, this is not pastor telling you. This is in the Bible. And how do you do this? Well, the Bible first says this again. Go, go there, in chapter, step four. It says this. Uh, but if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and like a tax collector. In other words, you, know, you will let them loose. You cut them loose. You are no longer going to have a connection. You cut ties with that person. And the church eventually... Hopefully never will have to be in our church. I don't think we will, but hopefully not. But that there is a process called discipline. And there's another process called uh, disfellowshipment. We only disfellowship a person when the person no longer wants to become a member. If somebody comes to church and says, I no longer want to become a member, it's painful to us. We love the person, but we will respect their wishes. Do you follow what I'm saying? Makes sense. We'll follow it, right? But, but here, here, here's what happens is that, that we, we hardly ever understand what happens in this. This is painful. This is sad. This is not what it is. But somebody may say, but pastor, aren't we supposed to love everyone? Aren't we supposed to love sinners? Aren't we supposed to welcome everybody in the church, you know? And yes, we are. We are. But here is a difference. Listen to me right now. Are you guys listening? Pay attention. I'm even coming here a little closer to you. There is a difference between a sinner who does not know God, who does not love God, has not given his life to Jesus Christ yet. This sinner we hang out with, we help, we support, we pray. But this is one person. Now, there is a difference between somebody who claims to be a Christian, is a church leader, a pastor, a deacon, an elder, a leader, or whatever. He claims to be a Christian. He claims to follow God. He picks up, he wants to look pious, but he is as nasty as the devil. He's toxic to everybody else. And he continues to live in sin. There is a world of difference between a sinner who does not know and a sinner who is intentional about his sinning. Do you hear what I'm saying? So we are not discussing about the sinner, the person who does not know God, who needs God, who lives his life, a lifestyle that is not according to God's plan. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who knows, what, knows better, knows how they're supposed to live, and they don't. That's the person now we're about to see what the Bible actually tells us to do. And Paul is very harsh on this. I mean, we're about to read the guy who wrote about love. We're about to read the guy who said, you know, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. 
But look how Paul had to deal with this in his churches. This is Timothy. Timothy was his prodigy. Timothy was younger and he was pastoring a church. So Paul was writing him letters. This is the letter of 1 Timothy. He says this, talking to Timothy. This I charge you, I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies previous made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and good conscience. He's talking, he's encouraging Timothy. Timothy was having some issues at church as a pastor. And look what he says this, which some having what? Rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I did what? Deliver to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. What is he talking about? This is the guy who talked about love. He delivered somebody to Satan? What is he talking about in that context? What Paul is saying is this, you know what? I've done everything I could in my power to bring peace with that person. We met, we discussed, we prayed, I fasted. I've done everything. They did not change the behavior. What do I do? I let it go. I cut ties. I let it loose. Because you've done everything you could. Now, I, I, I watch, this is First Timothy. Almost four years later, Paul writes another letter to Timothy. And guess who is still there? Guess who is still creating problems? The same guy. And, and go to 2 Timothy. And he said this, Bashan profane and idle babblings. But they, but, for they will increase in more godliness, godliness, ungodliness. They're discussing things that don't matter. Discussing stuff, you know, coming up with new teaching, new light that they only thought, you know, this is my, I got to teach everybody else. Now everybody else must, must believe how I believe. That's what they were doing in church. And he says what? And their message will spread like, it will spread like cancer. And he measures Hymenaeus, and now he says another one, Philetus are of this sort. He is bringing before the church because they've done everything they could everything in their power to change their behavior and they did not change and he says these guys are toxic their message spreads like cancer and you know cancer can kill you if you don't take care of it now in, and, and in the same book just a few uh, verses ahead I'm, not, I'm going to read this passage now and, and, and this is the beauty of this. And you, I, cut this, I cut this passage in half, more than half. Look at this. Says, For I know that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. And it goes on in a very, very long list. You guys know this verse, right? Right? This verse we usually use in prophet seminars, talking about the last days. And doesn't that look like the world today? I mean, people that don't know God, that don't, love, don't, don't have morals, right? You may not have God, but you still have morals. That's great. But this here is a picture of the world. But here is the, here's the bombshell. Paul is not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. Yes, in the church, blasphemers, lovers of money, boasters, proud, unforgiving, uh, unloving, unholy. You know how we know this? Continue reading. Having a form of, a form of godness, but denying its power. And what does he say next? From such people, do what? You do what? Turn away. So what this is saying here is this. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. If you find people in the church that time after time, year after year, meeting after meeting, they're always toxic. They're always undermining things. Or family members. At every Thanksgiving, they try to do something. At every Christmas dinner, they try to put somebody down. They're always toxic. They're always bringing stuff that is relevant. They're always like put people down in church, at work. These kind of... What, what should you do with these people? You do what? You do what? Turn away from them. He says this, you know what? 
I've done everything I could in my power to live at peace with you. But I let you loose. I will let the Lord take care of you. You know, I do not want to deal with this anymore. Enough is enough. You are not going to hurt me and my family again. Period. It will stop here. Period. Done. No more. Some of us have toxic relationships of our lives. That enough is enough. A time comes in which you have just cut ties. Don't get involved. Don't invite them to your house anymore. Don't. Because every time they creep in, they come once a year and you keep thinking about what they said at, at, at Thanksgiving table for, for the next year. <laughs> and wondering if you should invite them back again. Toxic people. Cut them loose. From such people, you do what? You do what? Turn away. Enough is enough from toxicity in the church, toxicity in your house, toxicity in your marriage. Tell your spouse, enough is enough, whether you change it or something's about to happen. Enough is enough. Turn away from people like this. And that includes if your husband or your wife beats you, threatens you, manipulates you, you have to cut ties with them. And I'll talk more about this next year, February. Mark the dates down. February, I'll talk about this here. Preparing the sermon already. But I want you to understand this. Don't let toxic people drag you down. Don't let them bring you down and poison yourself for the whole year. So the question, you know, <laughs> what do I do next? In church? Pastor, half of my leaders are toxic. <laughs> what do I do? Pastor, you, know, you don't know my family. My whole family is toxic. Do I hide in a cave? What do I do? Well, there's more to it. But I want you to read this verse here. That's the verse that uh, uh, Mutsa read it to us here. This is Romans 12. Look what he said. There's a lot of wisdom. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. I, I want you to read this text now. If it's... If it, is, if it is possible, as far as it depends on, you live at peace with everyone. You see, Paul is amazing. If he, he's, he's a real guy. He knows that some people, that if, if there was a hell, they would not be going there because the devil could not deal with them. <laughs> some people are that bad. And he says, you know what, just, you know what, as long as it depends on you, do everything you can. And look what he says this. Do not take revenge. They hurt you, don't hurt them back. They smear your character, don't smear their character. They hurt your kids, don't hurt their kids. They, they spread lies about you, don't spread lies about them. Why? My dear friends, he says what? But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord is, will bring vengeance. The Lord will bring justice. The Lord. You and I don't know what justice is. And it says this. On the contrary. So what do you do with toxic people? One thing you, sh you turn away from them. But then what do you do next? It says, if your enemy is hungry, you do what? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but... Overcome evil with good. So hear me out here. You don't know what else to do? You cut ties with that person. Don't call them. Don't call them. They're hurtful. Don't call them. Or call them when you actually need. Don't talk them. Don't talk a whole lot to them. Don't engage with them. Don't bring them to your house. But if they need some help, they're hungry, they're sick, you'd go in, help but don't let them get involved any more than necessary in your life. Because, you know, they are toxic. They don't know they're toxic possibly. And, and they, they will continue to hurt you. They will destroy your marriage. They will bring you down. They will disrupt the relationship you have with your kids. These people are toxic. They need Jesus. Like all of us. But you don't have the power to heal them. And if you've been thinking that you can heal them, you can't. All these years. How did that work out for you? 
pitiful, and you know that. So you do not deny, coming up now to, to a closure here, you do not deny your problems. There are things you may ignore, but there are things you know they're toxic. In church, at work, at a family, at school, you know, at, at your job, you know they're toxic. You cannot ignore them. You cannot stall them. You cannot retaliate. You have to address it the way Jesus taught us to do. And if a leaders in the church we were about to really do this well, would avoid so much more heartaches and issues in the church and avoid so much discussions and just things, just a waste of time. I hope in the name of Jesus we will be able to do this more often. Turn away from people that are hurting you. Turn away. Even in the church, they want to look godly. They, they're always quoting the Bible. They, they show up to every meeting, but they're toxic. You're not gonna, doesn't mean you're not gonna say hello, you're gonna be unkind, you're gonna be rude. No, you say hello, fine. But don't bring him to your house. Because if you bring them, I can guarantee you they will leave toxicity in your house. And they will poison your heart, your soul. And before you know, you start developing feelings you've never had before because of toxic people. Enough is enough. And as, as we're closing here, I have an appeal for two kinds of people. Maybe the, the praise team, Jesse, can come as well as we're closing. I wanna, I'll speak to two kinds of people. The first one is that you're tired of toxicity in your life. No, everything we've discussed in the last two sermons, you know people put you down in the past. And, and you're tired of toxic people. You're tired and you want to find closure. You want to find healing for your wounded soul. You're tired, you're exhausted, you're restless. Matthew 8, 8, 11 says this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find what? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Maybe somebody walked in today for the very first time and you burdened. You know you have toxic people. Maybe your parents are toxic. Every time you talk to your mother, she criticizes your spouse, your kids. Toxic. Toxic. How do I honor my parents? You help them. You bless them. But don't bring them into your life anymore. You need to find healing. You can only find in Jesus. Today is the opportunity to come to Jesus. Says Jesus, I have so much toxicity in my heart today that I need you, Jesus. I need you in my heart to set me free from this. The next passage is for the second group of people. If you've been toxic, you know you mean to people. You're prideful, you're arrogant, you put people down, you're sinning and you can't control it. You know you need a detox. What is it? What the Bible says, Romans 5.20? But where sin increased, what else? Grace increased all the more. This whole series is more than toxic faith. This whole series is about grace. Jesus is gracious to toxic people as well. If you have been toxic, if you hurt people, you can find grace as well. And the last verse of, of, of today is this. Can you read this with me? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will do what? Forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus had to deal with all the toxicity in the world, with all the sins, with all the impurities of all the sins and He bled and died on that cross. So you and I don't have to carry that burden anymore. So you and I can find healing for our wounded soul. Jesus was bruised. He was trespassed. So you and I don't have to be wounded. We don't have to be trespassed in this world. Come. Enough is enough. You don't judge the root, but you judge the fruit. Don't let any more toxic people destroy your marriage. Your joy, your happiness, you cut them loose, but you surrender them to the, the justice of God. And God will take care of it. This is the only path towards healing. If you ignore it, deny it, stall it, or retaliate, you will never come to, to find healing and closure. 
May the Lord Jesus bring healing and closure to all the wounded hearts we have in this church. If somebody would like to be baptized or rebaptized, if the Lord spoke to you today in a way, you know, recommit your life to Christ. I'll be right there at the end. I'm meeting with Taisha here after service, but I'll be right here just for a few minutes to talk to you. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, by all means, come and speak to me. If you want to be renewed, refreshed, transforming Jesus, we're here to help you. We're all on the same journey together. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you all the glory and honor for who you are. What I pray will bring healing and closure to our hearts. We've been wounded. We've been hurt. And there are people in our lives, they are toxic, Lord, and it is difficult because they are our family. They are our parents. Our, sometimes even our spouses. Just help us, Lord, to trust you. And say enough is enough. And allow, Lord, that you will change what needs to be changed. Bless us. May the process of healing begin today. And we will trust that you will bring justice in due time to all of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray.